Okay, I think we will um, we'll start then. So, hi everybody, and welcome to uh, this this uh, afternoon's Wessex Arche Archaeology webinar. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, I hope you're all sitting comfortably and ready uh, for us to start over the next hour. So um, I'll just begin by giving you an introduction to who we are. So um, I'm Maddie Gilbert. I'm the Communications and Marketing Manager at Wessex Archaeology. Um, and then I'll be joined shortly. Um, I'll be handing over to Inez Lopez de Riga, who is our Senior Environmental Archaeologist at Wessex Archaeology. And she'll be talking all things environmental archaeology. Before I do that, I'll give you a short introduction to Wessex Archaeology, who we are, what we do. So we are an archaeology and heritage company, and we're also an educational charity. And as a company, what we do is we help our customers to manage the impact of change and development on the historic environment. Now, the majority of this, um, of what we do is kind of ahead of development. So before something like a housing estate or a railway can be developed, our experts investigate the archeology span and heritage of the site. They look at everything that might be impacted and they help the developer um, understand what to do with it um, and how it might affect the development. Uh, so we record and analyze what we find and then we make sure all of that information is made available to um, the local community and also to the wider general public and we do that in a lot of uh, different ways um, including things like this webinar today. So as you can see from some of these images uh, we work in a huge variety of different environments um, so there's obviously the traditional kind of um, digging in the ground image of archaeology, but we also work offshore. Uh, we work in intertidal zones and riverine environments. Uh, we also work uh, with beautiful historic buildings. Um, it's it's a hugely um, it's a hugely um, a huge variety of things that we do um, and you can also see that we do a lot of um, quite sciencey and techy things as well in that um, so for example we've got you know a whole drone fleet there um, and um, a whole um, a whole team of um, very experienced specialists that help us kind of analyze what we find as well now, as an educational charity, uh, we do a lot of community engagement, and that's really at the heart of what we do. Um, it means that we can work with you know, communities and schools, um, school children up and down the country, and we can connect people with their past and use archaeology as a tool for educating people about subjects like um, science and technology and culture and heritage as well. So that is us in a nutshell. So that is all from me. Um, what I'll do now is hand over to Inez. Hello, and welcome to this webinar by Wessex Archaeology. I'm going to speak about environmental archaeology. My name is Inez Lopez de Riga, and I'm the lead environmental archaeologist at Wessex Archaeology. Um, my talk is going to be um, focused in two parts. Um, it's going to be first about what is environmental archaeology in general, and later I'm going to speak about what do we do in the environmental department at Wessex Archaeology. Um, first, I also want to speak about um, what's archaeology, or rather archaeologies. Uh, there isn't a single type of archaeology. Uh, there is um, academic archaeology, which starts from people asking uh, questions to archaeological sites. There is as well um, commercial archaeology, which is the main type of um, archaeology that we do at Wessex Archaeology. And it starts with somebody wanted to build something somewhere uh, that leads to the investigation of a site, and which allows us archaeologists to put some questions to the site and then um, the site gets either um, scheduled, if it's very, very important, or it gets um, planning permission and we investigate however much is necessary for the planning permission to be obtained. And a third type of archaeology is community archaeology, which uh, it's something in between um, commercial and academic archaeology, and it, it's um, feedback between site investigation uh, and uh, questions. So people are interested in how the um, site was in the past, uh, for example, their village in uh, medieval times, and they um, try to investigate it. 
Um, as well, um, most people are familiar with um, fieldwork archaeology, which is the most visible part of um, uh, archaeology, but it's only the tip of the iceberg in um, uh, archaeological work. So there is a lot of um, work happening in labs and indoors, and it's um, the post-excavation process, so mostly assessment and analysis in commercial archaeology. And it's most of the time. So from um, uh, investigation of a um, site in the, in the field, uh, till the uh, completion of the analysis can pass several years. Um, the people who work in um, these um, uh, labs are called post-excavation specialists, and there are two main types. of They are specialists in uh, artifacts or finds, specialists, and specialists in ecofacts or environmental archaeologists. Um, so, yeah, today we are going to focus on environmental archaeology, but more particularly in uh, plant remains so, and seeds, which are the um, bulk of the um, evidence that we find in uh, the sites that we are studying in Wessex. Um, archaeobotanical remains can be uh, distinguished in two types. Um, there are macro remains and micro remains. Macro remains are the ones that you can see with the naked eye, although to study them you need a um, powerful, uh, but not very powerful, microscope. And the micro remains are the ones that are really, really tiny. You cannot see them with the naked eye, and you need a very powerful microscope to study them. So, microbotanical remains are, for example, pollen, which um, most people are familiar with because that's what produce um, allergies in spring. Uh, pollen grains can inform about um, past environments when they are found in archaeological sites. Uh, although there are some problems, for example, some trees produce more pollen than other trees. So sometimes we need to be careful on how we interpret the um, data that we find in archaeological sites. Um, there as well spores that are found in the same types of um, environments as pollen. Uh, the problem with these types of evidence is that they are not preserved in all archaeological sites. So, for example, pollen survives well in um, acid soils, uh, and we cannot rarely find any pollen grains in very basic environments. Um, phytoliths are silica body of um, plants that we find in archaeological sites where plants have been processed. Uh, so these um, bodies are released uh, when plants have been burned or cut and inform about use of plants. It's the same with the starch grains. They are present in um, underground power parts, plant parts, and are released when uh, these are cooked. Uh, for example, in pottery vessels, there are remains of the starch plants that were cooked in there. Diatoms are unicellular algae that are also find in sites with uh, uh, water and can inform about um, the landscape and also features that used to contain water, like for example, ponds. And we uh, focus a lot of our work in macrobotanical remains. So it's um, a very diverse type of uh, uh, evidence. There, are, there is good wood charcoal, uh, seeds, leaves, leaves and berries, roots and tubers, capsules, thorns, stalks, stems, chaff, seed pods, cones. So yeah, very, very variable material. Um, you may have noticed that all of this is actually organic evidence. And um, you may be aware that this would normally decompose in uh, most depositional environments. Um, I will speak about later about how these types of uh, plants are preserved in archaeological sites. They are never ever preserved as they are in these pictures. Um, we also have transformed botanical remains. So, for example, transformed um, wood that has been made into implements or um, pieces of textile or fibers that, from uh, plant origin that have been woven to make um, uh, containers. Bread, for example, that can contain inclusions of plants that are still identifiable, 
or crusts in pottery that have been used for cooking, imprints of um, plant remains in pottery, and also coprolites, which contain remains of plants. Um, so as I said, we have a problem with uh, macrobotanical remains because they are made of um, organic matter. Macrobotanical remains uh, are preserved by three different types of uh, processes. We have um, mineralized plant remains, waterlogged plant remains, and chair plant remains. Um, mineralized plant remains are the ones that are preserved, for example, in cesspits, where there is a lot of um, organic matter in the composition and it's often waterlogged, and also there is little oxygen, and that produces um, replacement of the phosphates uh, by the decomposition of organic matter, um, which replaces the uh, uh, soft um, parts of the of the seeds, for example, and that allows to preserve a range of plants that we normally don't find in archaeological sites and inform about diet. Other type of mineral replacement is that produced by contact with metal objects, for example, um, plant remains that are attached to buckles can inform about the textiles that were worn by people in the past. Um, waterlogged plant remains are those that are preserved in water, permanent water conditions. So for example, sites that have um, um, are near the shore or near rivers and are always inundated and preserve uh, waterlogged plant remains that are representative of the environment. Chad plant remains are the most frequently found on archaeological sites. Um, they are preserved by carbonization, which is always an accidental process and um, leads to the incomplete burning of organic matter and allows for the preservation of um, these remains in archaeological sites for a very long time. Um, the problem with um, carbonization is that not all plant parts survive equally to fire. So, for example, in this case, we have um, cereals, cereal grains, and they are quite um, sturdy and resist very well um, fire. But other plant parts, so for example, leaves, usually turn to ashes rather than um, become carbonized. And the advantage of a char plant remains is that they inform us about what people were often uh, cooking um, when they had accidents cooking. So what do we do when we study plant remains and particularly macrobotanical remains in archaeological sites? Well, we one of the main purposes is to study diet, fast diet. Um, so for example, if we have if we have um, luck and we find a um, bug body with them um, plant remains in the stomach, we can be quite certain that those plant remains were part of the diet. But that's a very rare uh, scenario. And often we have to um, study diets through other indirect indicators like um, plant remains preserved in teeth. For example, the calculus in teeth can preserve um, phytolites and pollen grains and lipids from plants. Or we can study residues in pottery that were used uh, for cooking. We can also study bread that was used in um, in the past, and sometimes we can identify plant remains still, um, for example, in bread that was wasn't um, very well uh, ground. And we can also study. This is ninety percent of the cases plant remains that were carbonized, and we can try to interpret which of those plant remains that were carbonized were actually part of food products and which weren't. One of the main problems in uh, archaeological sites is to find out whether the plant remains that we find are part of um, intentional products that were brought to the site or if they were accidentally present there. So for example, seeds like these with spikes, they are usually found in archaeological sites and they may have arrived attached to um, clothing or to animal hair. Plants like these produce seeds that are dispersed by wind and can also arrive very easily 
to archaeological sites unintentionally and end up char being charred in a fire. Uh, and there are other ways in which plants can arrive uh, in a similar accidental matter, manner. Uh, another way, for example, is the case of weeds, uh, or what we call weeds, which are wild plants growing in crop fields. And these were probably gathered accidentally in most of the cases, although some of those plants might be useful. But anyway, they were brought unintentionally to the site and then they were discarded and they are often uh, carbonized. Fortunately, these types of uh, plants are usually informative about the growing conditions of uh, crop fields, so they are not completely uh, useless. Uh, yeah, and the other main point of environmental archaeology, as the name suggests, is studying the environment. The problem with studying past environments is that all archaeological evidence is biased in some way by how it is preserved and where it is preserved. So to study past environments, we normally need to put together a lot of data originating from different types of um, um, evidence. So for example, we need to put together pollen data and where waterlogged plant remains from same deposit to obtain a picture of how the environment works. Um, so now, um, who are we? Uh, we environmental archaeologists at Wessex. Well, we have a team of um, seven people. Um, we have um, Lenny, Jenny and Liz who work in um, the processing team uh, in Salisbury and Fiona in Sheffield. And they are in charge of preparing the samples that arrive from archaeological sites. They are doing something called uh, flotation, which is um, separation of a floating uh, light fraction of the samples from the sediment. And this floating fraction, which is called the flood, is usually rich in environmental evidence, such as seeds and charcoal and snails and insects. So um, the flood that is retained here it's later dried and studied, sorted under the microscope by Nikki, who's here separating the different types of environmental material from samples. Um, then I am given the extracted material from each sample and I then identify the plant remains in them, um, usually with the help of a reference collection and also with specialized atlases. And then I produce reports um, um, informing about how the landscape was on the site or what plants were people using at the uh, period of occupation. I'm going to speak a little bit about my background because that's going to influence a lot how <clears throat> which um, types of um, sites I'm going to select from my experience in Wessex archaeology. So um, in the past I've always been involved in all the stages of the process uh, in environmental archaeology, from taking the samples to processing them and studying them. So this is actually quite lucky uh, because um, I have now people doing the dirty work for me. But anyway, um, um, I've been doing my PhD in um, the use of plants by <clears throat> Mesolithic and Neolithic people in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, so Mesolithic and Neolithic, for those of you who are not familiar, are the basically periods where we have the change from hunting gathering as a way of life to farming. And that's quite interesting because why did, did, did that happen? It's still, we still don't know why that happened. And it's very different in different parts of the world. Uh, so it's, it has scope for a lot of research. So I've been doing that in, um, as I said, in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, and Spain and Portugal, but I've been also doing that in Syria and in Argentina, the first uh, settlers. And um, I've also um, uh, researched the first settlers in the Balearic Islands who were as well the first farmers. And because I'm very, very interested in the last uh, hunter and hunting gathering and the early farmers, I've also, I'm also very interested in hazelnuts, which are very, 
important resources in these types of um, uh, chronologies. So I have selected a few of my favorite studies uh, that I've undertaken at Wessex. Um, we have, for example, the case of of Zoro archaeology, where we have um, colleagues, usually in a bunch of um, building um, uh, wind farms, uh, go and take samples, um, of core samples through the sediments underwater. These core samples are then studied by our colleagues, the, the geoarchaeologists, who select the most um, appropriate sediments for taking samples, so for example here, and um, they provide us with samples that we then process and study the plant remains of information on how the environment was when those um, lands were emerged rather than submerged. Similar type of um, environment, but very different type of archaeology is the one from Coastal and Marine Department. And for example, we have studied two wrecks recently with stable wrecks in, in Kent. We have Tankerton, which is a 16th century wreck um, that was found um, accidentally in the in the coast of um, Whitstable. And um, we took several samples from this wreck. We found this um, seed here of fruit that had me puzzled for a very, very long time. I spent hours and hours trying to identify it. This is this scale here is one millimeter. Um, finally, I eventually discovered that um, it wasn't a seed associated to the wreck at all. It was just a fossil that was present in the environment that had been washed on the site. But fortunately, we had lots of other evidence of the use of the wreck. So we have this um, uh, cereal brand, which um, informs about diet by the people who use the wreck and the sanitary conditions, which weren't great because this is preserved in fecal material. Uh, but we also found lots of um, plant remains from wild plants, uh, either plant uh, macrofossils, so seeds, but also pollen grains. And this particular case is very interesting because this is some um, spruce pollen grain, which um, is not a native tree in the UK and it's growing mostly in the Baltic area. So this informs us about this ship having probably traveled to the Baltic while it was um, not wrecked. These uh, hairs were also found in the corking, and um, we haven't analyzed them ourselves, but we have sent them to an external specialist um, who identified goats and sheep and boars, and, and these are animals that the hairs of these animals were mainly used for caulking in Scandinavia. So thanks to environmental evidence, we can suggest that this ship had very strong connection with the Scandinavia, Scandinavian region. Well, before we only thought that it was a, a local um, um, ship. We also found a very exciting uh, seed. Uh, this is a kiwi seed and because this is um, 16th century, this could be an indicator of very early trade. Um, kiwi is not a native plant of Europe, it grows in Southeast Asia, uh, and its presence in um, archaeological deposit could indicate that there was some um, trade with that part of the world. However, we redecarbon dated it and it was modern, so we had our exciting discovery of the century uh, was. The other wreck that we studied recently um, is the old brick in Seasolder, and it's one century uh, later than um, Tankerton. We took several samples from it, and they all represent the depositional environment of when the ship was wrecked, which is not very exciting, but we found also plant remains inside this um, olive jar. Uh, of the Spanish origin. And um, it is exciting because um, we think that this vessel was associated with smuggling and we found um, plum and walnuts, which may have been smuggled products um, together with all the things that were smuggled. Um, 
And in a completely different side, we have uh, also waterlogged plant remains in completely different types of archaeological sites. So, for example, in Bath Abbey, our colleagues were digging under the current abbey to uh, allow for uh, structural work to be undertaken. And they have found lots of interesting artifacts and remains from medieval uh, buildings and the medieval the Norman Abbey. But also they have found very interesting deposit from the Georgian period, late 18th century, with waterlogged plant remains that inform about what people were eating in the refreshments uh, areas in, in the vicinity of Bath Abbey. So there is the seeds of apple and blackberry and elder, which suggests maybe people were having um, fruit cocktails. We are now traveling to visual Salisbury Plain to study some of the sites um, discovered during the Army Basin program. Um, if you haven't heard about this, it's um, um, development of um, large housing areas for army people who are returning to the UK from um, uh, Germany. And um, this is this has been done very near the World Heritage site around Stonehenge. And we have found really interesting archaeological sites. One of them is Bullford, where we found a um, double henge monument uh, from the Bronze Age, uh, which has been scheduled. So the housing state is not here anymore. And we have also found lots of evidence from an earlier period. Um, these all are Neolithic bits, which is for me the most interesting um, part of the site. And these Neolithic bits have provided lots of interesting artifacts. Um, they have different fields and plins and chalk objects that are very, very exciting for uh, people who are excited about plins. However, for me, the most interesting are the hazelnuts. So we have lots of charred hazelnuts which indicate or highlight the importance of um, wild plant exploitation in early farming societies. However, we find hazelnuts in many archaeological sites. So why is this important? Well, because they are really, really abundant and also because we have found the kernels of the hazelnuts as well in some of the bits. Um, finding the kernels is a very, very rare scenario, which is only produced in a, in a few cases in specific fire and temperature conditions. And um, it's probably a result of roasting hazelnuts in underground pits. So there's been quite a lot of um, experimental work um, trying to replicate scenarios where you can produce this sort of assemblage. And one of the most likely explanations is pit roasting. So we've built this model. This is a section of a pit, and this has been done by our colleague Andy Sol, who's an archaeologist as well. He does really good models. And this pit has been um, lined with sand, which is a heat conduction material. Pits, uh, the hazelnuts have been um, put inside. We are speaking about thousands of hazelnuts. Yeah. Um, then the hazelnuts are covered with sand, and then a fire is made on top. This would be would, this would be a very efficient way of um, roasting hazelnuts in bulk, and this would produce the accidental carbonization of a few of the hazelnuts. And we think that this is the case for some of the pits in Wolford. Um, another site very exciting in terms of archaeology, not so much in terms of archaeobotany, was Black Hill. Uh, there was a Neolithic coast guard enclosure where um, we found this really interesting feature and it's been preserved as well. Uh, very little or very few child plant remains were found in this site, unfortunately, but we found some um, imprints in a cremation urns. So, for example, this is a, pot, a barley imprint in from this um, vessel. Another site that we dug from the Salisbury office um, in Hampshire is the Bleak Hill Quarry. 
this is similar to Bullfrog and probably also Neolithic. Uh, I don't have some um, ready common dates yet. Um, I'm hoping to obtain some dates in these um, serials here, but um, it has all the indicators suggesting that this is an um, early farming deposit with importance of um, cereal cultivation and wild plant gathering. So we have the typical hazelnuts as, get, uh, as well, uh, but we have all the special things. So for example, a huge deposit of roasted um, acorns. Um, we think they are roasted because Again, as kernels of hazelnuts, these type of remains are not normally preserved in archaeological sites. Other types of um, plant remains from this site are sloes and crab apples. And finally, the last of these sites of the last hunter gatherers and early farmers is uh, Langesni, a site in Wales, where the archaeology again wasn't really exciting. There were a few post holes and a few pits, and people digging then thought that these were Romano British, and actually there was a lot of evidence of the Romano British period. However, some of the pits were also Neolithic. And we have redecarbonated some of the grains, and we've obtained very, very early dates for the cereals. So the cereals would have arrived from the uh, Near East or Southwest Asia because the earliest dates for cereals in Britain, in the coast, are older than the earliest dates of Britain of cereals inland, we think that probably these domesticates were brought by sea, and Wales is one of the cases in which um, um, people arrived earlier. And to conclude, I have the last slide, which is at Sereford, where there is, um, there is evidence for a very long occupation from the Bronze Age. Uh, we've discovered these uh, huge monumental barrows from that period. The environmental evidence from them is not great either. Um, the site was also used in the Iron Age and the Romano-British period. So, for example, this is a crop dryer that was used in the Romano-British period to dry grain and we have lots of um, cereal grain from here but for me the most exciting um, find or archaeobotanical find in this site is um, this grain this is a uh, free threshing grain uh, wheat in particular and this type of um, cereal is widespread from the early medieval period onwards and we had Prior to finding this, we had very little evidence of this period in this site. So if we hadn't found this grain, this period of occupation in the site would have been completely um, um, undetected. So thanks to environmental archaeology, we have been able to find out that people were inhabiting this area as well in the early medieval period. And this is uh, my selection of favorite sites from my experience in Wessex archaeology. Um, thank you for your attention and I hope you have some questions that I can answer later. Thank you so much, Inez. Um, so we've had uh, a few questions uh, while you've been speaking. So, um, so what I'll do is I'll just dive right in and um, and pose the questions to you. So um, somebody's asked, how often do you analyse environmental remains um, within kind of commercial archaeology? Is it on all sites that we excavate? No, it's not on all sites. It's, um, it depends on the type of um, uh, intervention that we are doing. So, for example, the interventions which are just um, test fitting or uh, watching briefs, and those usually have either a small number of samples or uh, no samples at all. Um, and, for example, mitigations, which is basically a um, Low, uh, large area excavation, we normally have a large number of samples from those but as well. It depends on the importance of the site and the nature of the uh, deposit. I see, okay. And and what sort of, what's a typical sample size that you take, um, let's say, of the macro remains from a site? So we take um, the samples of about 40 litres from uh, deposits that are well preserved. Sometimes we consider that 
10 liters of uh, sediment are enough, for example, if we see a lot of concentration of uh, charcoal, or if the evidence is um, waterlogged. But yeah, 40 liters is normally the standard. Interesting. Okay. And um, somebody else has asked, uh, how do you identify a plant or uh, any sort of um, organic remains, let's say, that might not easily be recognized? So, for example, if it's, uh, if it's rare or particularly exotic or even maybe extinct, how do you, how do you kind of find it, figure out what that is? So to identify remains, we have to um, uh, use a um, reference collection of modern plants. But the problem is no reference collection is complete because um, yeah, where do you stop and what do you call complete? So uh, sometimes we have a reference collection for a specific uh, part of the world, imagine Britain, but then we have sites uh, that have been um, involved in trade, uh, for example, in a wreck uh, that might have come from a different part of the world. So yeah, sometimes we have mysterious plants that we have uh, trouble identifying and sometimes we manage to identify them in the end, but yeah, it's not always successful. Mm. And what's the most uh, mysterious thing that you found or interesting thing? Um, well, for example, um, I mentioned earlier the, the fossil from Tankerton, uh, that was um, one of the difficult ones and yeah, it, it doesn't exist in, in this country anymore and it, the modern plant exists in Africa. Um, as well, there are other plants that, um, for example, in Bleak Hill, I didn't mention this one in particular, but um, there was a seed from a plant, uh, Midland Hawthorn. Uh, I haven't completely identified it yet, but I'm quite um, uh, suspicious that it's probably that one. I still uh, don't have that seed in the reference collection, so I'm waiting for trees uh, to produce seeds so I can go and take a sample from them and compare them with my archaeological specimen. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and so that, so your reference collection, where do you get it from? So you, obviously you saying there, somebody's asked kind of, where do you, where is all of that kind of bulk of the collection from? Um, so you said kind of, you know, collection from modern plants. Is it, is it something that you yourself collect or do we, do you get sent them or how do you? I yeah, it's a little bit of um, everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, to start with, when I arrived at Wessex, there was already a reference collection, but uh, mm -hmm. as I said, um, there is never a complete reference collection. So I've been expanding it with um, seeds that I've been either gathering myself uh, or other colleagues have gathered for me. And also in exchange with um, other colleagues who have uh, complete reference collections or more complete, um, as well from botanical gardens and also buying them from uh, seed supplies but yeah some mm. species are difficult to get from uh, all um, of these um, sources so it's, um, it's a tricky question sometimes. Mm, definitely um, so one last question um, how do you go about extracting pollen remains from inside pottery artifacts? Ah um, that's a good question. <laughs> Actually, um, for example, from the pottery matrix itself, um, I'm not certain, I don't think it's possible, but yeah, sometimes pottery have um, uh, residues uh, that are, are either visible or invisible to the, to the naked eye, but we can um, treat them uh, in a lab, a special lab. We don't do this in Wessex, but we have a, a collaboration with other uh, university departments who do, and they um, they can extract any uh, invisible plant remains, uh, for example, uh, lipids um, or phytolids, and yeah, pollen as well. Fab. Okay. Um, and that that's all the questions we've had. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Inez. That was a really really interesting talk. Thank you for listening. Yeah, and thank you everybody for listening as well. Um, if you want more information about who we are, what we do, and um, environmental archaeology itself, you can uh, visit our website, which is www.wessexarch.co.uk, or you can also follow us on um, on social media. We've, we're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all at Wessex Arc, 
ARC again, spelt A-R-C-H. So, um, and we were, we're also on YouTube. So um, I would recommend um, giving us a follow um, and checking out what we do on any of those platforms. Uh, we've also got this rolling uh, weekly webinar on various different um, kind of expert subject matter. So uh, we've also so we've also got um, that on our events page if you want to know what we've got coming up. But thank you very much for um, attending and hope you have a good day.